my name is Dove from uh, Climate Outreach. I lead the Climate Engagement Lab. I'm delighted to be having a quick chat with Laura Williams from the Campaign for National Parks. Hello, Laura. Hello. Hello. And Toby Smith, who is lead on visuals at Climate Outreach. Hello, Toby. Morning, Dave. Morning, morning. Um, right. First of all, we've just uh, we're just concluding a partnership with the Campaign for National Parks as part of the Climate Engagement Lab. Laura, do tell us who are the Campaign for National Parks? What are you trying to do and how did we help? So Campaign for National Parks is a small independent charity. Um, it's the independent voice for national parks in the UK. Um, we started life as a standing committee for national parks, which pushed for the creation of the legislation um, that led to the first national parks in the UK. And for 85 plus years since, we've been campaigning to protect and improve national parks in England and Wales. Um, at the moment, our, we're sort of launching into new exciting periods with a, a new business plan and, and direction. And our focus is on um, ensuring the parks are enabled to do more for people, nature and climate. So that they are able to play their role in tackling the climate emergency, but also that they are accessible and um, inclusive for all. Um, we've seen record numbers of visitors over the last few years um, with the pandemic and the periods between lockdown. And, and it's a really exciting time with more people um, benefiting from the parks. And um, we're sort of leading the, the growing movement of people who care about national parks. So much for that. Um, so tell me a little bit about the where you were at a few months ago before Climate Outreach started to partner with you. What was the challenge that you were struggling with and how did we help you with it? So we are a really small team um, and we do a lot and we are quite often in in the doing space. You know, there were there were three of us working part time and a, and a full time chief executive. And we, we, we very much just sort of crack on and, and do our bits. Um, and we really needed to sort of pause and step into that strategic space and think about um, what we do, how we do it, and, and crucially why we do it. And we've, we've been doing that with our overall business plan. I've been developing a comms plan. And we know how important visual language is. We're sort of embarking on a bit of a, a rebrand. And so we're really excited to get your expertise to help us um, embed that visual language into, into our comms and campaigning work um, and, and the direction of travel, really, and make sure we were, we were at this crossroads and we were getting it right from the off. Um, so that's why we sort of teamed up with you, really. And Toby, do you want to just give us a little short intro to when Laura says visual language, what's she kind of talking about? What, what are Climate Outreach's visual principles and why does it matter? Yeah, good segue. So, so Climate Outreach um, runs the Climate Visuals Project. I'm the programme lead and Climate Visuals focuses on improving the, uh, the, the distribution but the impact of um, climate change photography. And we do that by having an an evidence-based background of social science research and accessible principles that give organizations and people just like Laura guidelines on what makes impactful content. Um, the move here that's significant is in 2021, we, um, in 2021, we were commissioned by, um, um, uh, Nat Nat ah. <laughs> We were, commissioned, we were commissioned by Natural England, the UK government body for national parks, to do an evidence-based piece of work to see if we could take our approach to what makes impactful climate photography to a new evidence-based piece of work on uh, how we could potentially improve um, nature visuals, specifically looking at um, diversity, equity and inclusion, about representation of different groups in the UK, and also, uh, you know, basically accepting and moving forward with a practical guide on you know, the, um, nature photography is not inclusive or representative of the UK population. And also the word nature is, it has a very narrow definition in visual vocabulary. And I think um, it was a really great opportunity for us at, at Climate Visuals to see, take everything we know about what does and doesn't work with climate photography and zero in on the, the kind of UK English context on what 
does and doesn't work in photography uh, specifically to improve engagement with a broader base of uh, subscribers and people to try and make nature more inclusive so I think this was a, a great opportunity as, uh, as climate visuals often does we release evidence and guidelines and we, we have an image library that shared resources and we also often do consultancy and partnerships with organizations to try and kind of have an increased uptake but this was a really like jigsaw puzzle piece fit of um how can we take a very fresh new piece of, of work on nature visuals and partner with um with, with laura on trying to actually really get our get our um kind of get our heads together on actually implementing them and you know uh, at a realistic scale as well, not just some sweeping campaign, but how can we make this work with um, with a small team and actually get some practical results as well? Thanks, Tavi. So, what did we what did we do, Laura? Tell us a little bit about uh, in practice what you are doing now that you weren't doing before. So, we um, had a really useful um, sprint day with with Toby, where we really thought about embedding that strategy in, into what we do. Um, and off the back of that, we um, did some testing. So we tested different images um, with different audiences on different digital channels, um, just to really help us understand who was engaging with what and in what space and in what way. Um, and it taught us, um, it taught us quite a few useful um, pointers to take forward. So it helped us um, really understand that our Instagram audience was really responsive to the diverse people images because ultimately that is one of our most diverse channels. Um, we kind of had an inkling, but this showed that it demonstrated that. Um, but we also interestingly found that there is an appetite for um, landscape images. Uh, which is, you know, as a national park charity, we, we've got no, no shortage of beautiful vistas of landscapes. Um, the people images were, were the challenge more. Um, and it was actually quite useful to know that, that actually that's okay. We can, we don't have to share people in every images. These images are connecting with people and they are prompting people to take action. And, and that was really useful to take forward. And, and it's, it's sort of informing how we approach our, our image archive and making sure we've got a good mix um, in there as well. What we also did for the first time is we, we run an annual scheme called the Park Protector Awards, where we invite people to nominate people, teams and projects that are um, dedicated to protecting and improving national parks. And usually it's a, it's a simple case of going online, filling out a form, and we we would say photos are encouraged uh, and I ran the awards last year and we got some some great nominations but they weren't really brought to life by the by a lot of the images that were submitted it was a lot of um kind of ill <laughs> a lot of um oh, it's hard it's hard to describe it was a lot of phone images that were kind of like um not that inspiring they were they were of damage in the parks for example not the people repairing the damage in the parks and things and um, there were some good ones in there but it wasn't consistent and so this year as part of the nomination process we actually included photo guidance for those nominating people and we based it on um, the climate visuals piece we embedded the six principles um, into into that um, guidance for submitting nominations and it was a totally different story this year the images we got were absolutely incredible and you know to the point of as I'm creating the carousel of images for the um, awards ceremony in the Houses of Parliament I'm kind of just feeling this immense sense of pride and welling up at just how diverse and um well it reflects the work actually going on on the ground and how how it shows it just it just kind of filled me with hope for 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 the future really um and it really brought those written stories to life in a way that it hadn't done in previous years and um we did originally make the photo submission a, a compulsory part of the the nomination um because we really wanted to 
to embed that that visual language but we did um we did make it um uh, optional towards the end of the process um because we didn't want it to restrict people from from nominating if they if they read that guidance and thought oh my goodness i i don't have any pictures that that would fit that so um uh, but you know we got enough pictures that that completely um adhered to that guidance and and clearly people had read it before submitting those and um, were absolutely delighted with the results yeah thanks laura yeah we'll, we'll put a link to the some of the photos in the yeah. in the blog that, that accompanies this so very quickly why is it so important to have people in photos what's the principle there so I think people have to see themselves in pictures. I think that's the kind of statement I, I feel like. And, and when to see themselves, that, that includes a human element to actually see a human activity in a landscape, not just the kind of causes or impacts of environmental degradation. Also seeing positivity, seeing solutions, whether that's climate solutions or physical solutions or just community solutions are, we know from our, our evidence and also all the stakeholder interviews we did as doing part of the Nature Visuals project that that people either spend a lot of time talking about the barriers they have to entering nature or a national park or or, or barriers they have to engaging with environmentalism like we, we don't see this as for us or the certain deep-rooted societal and cultural issues as to why potentially the full diversity of of the uk doesn't see themselves in these pictures but the having imagery that people can relate to and that is positive and that is close up and, and has a human story is i think universally in photography and campaign messaging just so so effective and humanizing in such a, a positive way um and i think some of the things that laura also said there also came out of our stakeholder reviews in producing the report i think specifically content gaps like the kind of imagery that we have a lot of is not the most effective uh, but it is still useful so pictures of landscapes um also kind of pushing past people's quick documentary photos they do on their phone that they might just have incidentally and starting to use photos that are maybe produced with a bit more consideration or guidelines as to what message or content is in a picture and and a process in which by those can be edited and highlighted and shared um and i think there's also some i was also really enjoying uh hearing laura talk about how in tune they are with the different audiences on their on their different platforms so one of the uh, original climate visuals principles is know your audience and we actually now start to say know your audience and their platform because there is an incredible correlation of of demography and different audience types per platform Instagram we're hearing is diverse and slightly younger. Twitter is slightly more conservative. Facebook is actually often touching the older generation. Uh, and there's, there's different nuances again on newsletters. So I think Laura is a really good example of someone who's really in tune with the different types of people that are their current audience and where they want to be, but also the different audiences using their different platforms and, and choosing content that fits with those people. Uh, and then uh, you know it, it, it's great to see that that is working and it ups the engagement yeah laura i was struck by uh, your building on what toby just said that you're not junking images of landscapes that that still means something is there anything else that, that you'd want to say about toby's audience's point anything else you've learned about the different ways images might be used um yeah i think we've we're in a in a, a quite unique position where a lot of our um a lot of our long-term supporters are um they're offline supporters actually um but where we learned that where they are online it is facebook because they are responding to stories about stalwarts of the national parks movement when we're sharing photos of people who've been faces in that movement for decades that's where we're getting the engagement on Facebook and that's useful to know because one of the challenges of, of organizations like ours who have that demographic I had it when I worked in the National Trust too it was it was a, a similar uh, challenge to, to grow those more diverse audiences is how you pivot them from offline into online how you get engage them on the online space and to know Facebook is your key platform for that bridge 
is really useful. Um, so, so there's that piece as well. I mean, we knew, I, I set up Instagram just a, a year and a half ago when I started here um, because we didn't have one, yet we were committed to accessible national parks for um, diverse groups. And, um, you know, we were seeing the emergence of groups like Black Girls Hike and Wanderlust Women and, and they are centered in Instagram and to not be there was, was um, it was a miss really. So we, we it, as soon as we went into that space, that's, those are the audiences we were engaging with from the off. So we, we knew that that was our key platform for younger, more diverse audiences, LGBT as well. Um, uh, and it was, yeah, it, it's been totally organic, but that's, we've got that sense of community in that space um, and not much crossover with that community on our other channels, you know. Um, some people have Instagram and no other social media, for example, they've got a token Twitter account that is updated once every few months, but Instagram is, is where they operate, it's where their heart and soul is, and that's where we need to be too. So yeah, that's that's where we are. You, you've talked a bit about um, feeling that the images you've got are more representative, feeling excited by the quality of stuff that's come in and, and having had that insight to different platforms and different audiences. What would you say the ongoing next few things you're gonna try and learn are, or the things that you feel like you, you wanna know more about that this work has helped you to dip a toe into? Yeah, so we're in a, um, we're in a space where our existing image archive um, is uh, sporadic is probably the right word. Um, you know, we we need, there's compliance issues to make sure that that is um, uh, where it should be. So uh, we've got the GDPR considerations and, and if we, you know, if we don't know who's in a picture, it, it needs to go. So we are at a, at a point where we're now identifying that the, we're auditing what imagery we've got, where the gaps are and how to fill those gaps. Um, we we are really fortunate that we're a, a, a sort of membership organization and we have a council and within that council there are members like the national trust the rspb the woodland trust all of the national park societies so we have relationships with people on the ground who are taking photos for their purposes and it for us it's about um one being clear what images we need but to being clear with the organisation submitting them, because we can't be out there taking all the images ourselves, but being clear um, what we're using them for, on what basis, and um, potentially across what platform, and, and what, what the reason is, and what the benefit is of um, people supporting us with those images. And Campaign for National Parks has a role in amplifying the voice of national parks with government. You know, we've gotten in with Parliament, we're talking regularly to MPs and ministers, we're submitting evidence to um, uh, calls for evidence and consultations. And we are, that's where our, our power lies. And we need support from the people on the ground to be able to do that. And part of that support is gonna be that visual language to really inspire people. Um, and what this has helped is, um, it's given us the tools to be able to be clear, consistent and, and transparent about that. Um, before it was more, more ad hoc. Oh, we need some photos for our climate report. I don't suppose you've got any photos of peatland restoration and then just see what you get. And now we can be a lot more strategic and a lot more um, targeted about that, which is, which is really useful. And we're gonna, it's gonna shape our, it's gonna shape our rebrand. It's gonna um, shape our image archive going forward and our procurement. And I wanna pull out an important point from the Nature Visuals is about um, diversity of procurement as well. So it's not about paying the ex um, newspaper photographer, an old, old, older guy in his fifties, an older white guy in his fifties to take photos because he's been doing it his whole life. It's about embracing 
um, diversity in that as well. You know, it, Instagram just shows just the talent out there among younger amateur photographers and, and we should be supporting that as well. So that's what we're going to do. And any other by final remarks, I guess, any, anything else if an organisation out there, your sort of size, your sort of scale is thinking about doing this? Any other tips you'd give them from what you've learned? Yeah, I mean, well, um, you know, we were fortunate to be part of this, this lab partnership, but actually climate um, outreach and climate visuals have a lot of free resources out there and you don't need to be part of a partnership to benefit from, from the work that's been done. So that nature visuals report and the six principles, that's a very easy digestible way that you can tweak how you approach um, your visual language. So um, yeah, I'd say definitely, definitely use that, but do make sure you're thinking about who is behind the camera as well as who's in front of it, which is exactly what's in your report, but um, it's so important. Yeah, Toby, um, anything you'd want to pull out as well for people to pick up and use, and also your reflections on anything you've learned as part of this partnership, or you, or you didn't know, or you've been able to test out? I just want to reinforce Laura's last point. It was also the point reinforced when we sent our draft report back out to our stakeholders group for kind of feedback was that that principle of diversifying who's behind the camera is absolutely the most critical because so many other things naturally rain down from that with regards to improving what things look like and community engagement and just getting the messaging right and feeling um, emboldened and uh, you know in, in a way of doing that without risking tokenization. Um, I think the bit that Laura naturally does, I want to give her credit for, is thinking about um, how to be movement generous, but also fair and ethical in the way you're partnering around content. And that can be commissioning people, but it can also be other ways of just maybe allowing people, if they have the means or desire, to donate images to uh, a non-profit organisation they support as a kind of way of currency, a way of a value exchange. But for those uh, Instagram influencers or a younger generation of freelancers or maybe smaller community networks that aren't even formally established, the role that um, campaigning groups can have in financially supporting them to produce content and how that can be then um, empowering for the wider community. And a really good basis for that is just um, thinking about the kind of legal structures and the contracts behind it. Um, they feel a, um, a boring and annoying phase to do, but it's actually quite quick to do it and offers just a really solid platform and scalable way of sharing content. So I think um, behind the scenes, there's a way of just making a, a really solid framework that enables a good ethical practice in how content's um, commissioned. Um, things, things I think we've learned personally is, is, is actually, you know, we do quite a lot of, as mentioned, we do consultancies where we're asked to help people edit pictures or source pictures, and they're often done kind of in isolation, we're often asked to help. Whereas I think this framework was a really good example of how we kind of rolled up our sleeves and for a very limited amount of time actually worked together on something rather than us doing it on behalf of or advising how to. And actually that was quite intense and we called it a sprint day and it was, uh, you know, but in that course of six to seven hours, there was an exchange of knowledge and practice which worked in both directions with a, a report and a campaign in mind and I think that was just um, incredibly rewarding and, and efficient and for the amount of time we actually spent working on it generated positive expertise exchange that will last a bit longer and I think that for me has meant uh, I will be rethinking how we approach consultancies or people requesting help from climate visuals I'll be leaning towards that that kind of model of a of an exchange or a lab-based format for the kind of again movement generous um, improvements for both parties um, um, yeah I, yeah I think as a as a small organization with very limited resources um that is exactly what we needed because we're so um busy doing day-to-day -day stuff that the strategic piece it's really hard to make space for that but if you have a dedicated day with the climate outreach expertise in the room you make space for it and actually it's it's really important to do that and um that was that was really really valuable for for certainly me as i'm i'm drafting the comm strategy and the rebrand looking to the rebrand so yeah 
Wonderful stuff. Thank you both so much for your time. Laura, thank you for being such an engaged, positive partner. Toby, thank you for bringing the research and the enthusiasm and all the very best, Laura, for the, what, what's ahead. Where should people go to have a little look at, this, at, at the work you're doing and see some of this stuff in action? Yep, so our website is cnp.org.uk and that's Campaign for National Parks. Our social media handles are Campaign for Parks, the number four, um, or you could search Campaign for National Parks, we'll be there. We do have a monthly newsletter as well and uh, thanks to this partnership that's full of lovely images too, so um, you can sign up for that on our website, um, but do, yeah, do um, find out more about what we're up to because it's uh, important work um, national parks are incredible places but they do need protecting and toby what's the one the one thing people should search for to, to download at our end um climatevisuals.org will bring you to the climate visuals page with all of our resources in the image library as well um and i'm also going to take the time to say thank you to dave and siri for actually making a bit of interdisciplinary collaboration happen that was what put climate visuals in the room with campaign for national parks so thanks to climate outreach and the lab project for making that happen too and thank yeah thank you from us as well it's really um it's been really great and um we uh will be sharing how it's impacted us you know on an ongoing basis because it's gonna it's gonna feed into our photo competition in the autumn it's gonna feed into our new perspectives bursary um scheme launch in the autumn as well it's gonna it's gonna go beyond the sort of time frame we've actually been in the same room so that's really great thank you wonderful all the best thank you Brilliant.